nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so my goal is Second lecture, 
you surely doing better, right? Okay, so what is the alternative method for achieving this? Different lectures, different classes, which one do you want to use? Different populations. Different populations. I can do the same lecture for two different groups. Okay? If I want to do that, <coughs> class one and class two. So here we have a two population problem. Can we still use this type of testing? This testing, we are testing a variable interest against some known number. But here we have two groups, two populations. It's a different story, right? So actually, in this case, we will use t-test. t-test will test whether new one is equal to new two. Right, still, okay, let's, let's assume we can do this. The same lecture. Is this perfect now? How can we make sure these two Experiments have one and only one variable, which is camera or not. Can we make sure about that? Can we make sure that two classes are identical to each other? You all have different backgrounds. You all have different personalities, right? Some people may be paying more attention with the camera. Some people may be distracted by the camera, right? So how do we control that? So actually, that's the more the bond. Topic, which is very often used in sociology, economics, when people want to study the influence of a specific treatment, like a medicine or some other treatment, like training, whatever, on their purpose. In that case, not only we need to use t-test, but also we need to control the variables. It's a control group and a treatment group, more complex in that case, right? But anyway, we have a good start with this. So now, let's say we have hypothesis testing. And we also need to specify several parameters there. What parameter do we need to specify? Is it alpha? Yeah. What does alpha mean? Okay. What does alpha mean? Let me try. What does alpha mean? So alpha is error rate, right? Yeah. So then does higher alpha mean Better test or worse test? Worse test. When alpha is increased, it means that we are kind of decreasing our estimation now, okay? Because alpha is an error. When alpha is higher, we are making basically tolerating higher error, right? Okay, so what else? You look at this formula. Alpha and what else? Sigma. Sigma. Sigma is assumed to be known, so what else? And sample size. Okay, let's say through the test, t test or normal test, whatever test, we make the conclusion that there's no major difference with the camera or without the camera. So this is our conclusion. Are we rejecting this type of test or not rejecting? Our happen test is that this one equal. And our conclusion is that they are equal, indeed, shown by data. Are we rejecting it or not rejecting it? No. No, not rejecting it. So by not rejecting the null hypothesis, we run a risk of what? Alpha <coughs> or one minus alpha or beta or gamma, whatever. We need to attack. Before we make decisions, we make decisions every day, every minute, actually, whether drinking water or not, or um, using a laptop or not, right? Whether listening to me or not. You're making decisions every moment. But whenever you make decisions, you are risking something, right? You are risking, you are risking something by making incorrect decisions. Does everyone agree with me that everyone makes mistakes? Yeah, right? We all make mistakes. 
So mistakes in decision making or approach testing, what does it mean by making mistakes in a hypothesis testing? Incorrect. Incorrect conclusion. You are concluding something, but this conclusion is not the same with the wrong truth. So then we have several different scenarios. So in this matrix, the horizontal shows the decision based on the samples. This all decision was made based on our samples. And here the vertical shows the reality with the ground truth. There are four different scenarios. First one is this element. The H now is true. Okay? If we make the decision that we reject which now we are basically making some mistake. So we call this mistake as type one error. And then we call the probability of making this kind of error as half error rate. That's first scenario. The second scenario, still H now is true, and we conclude based on the samples that H now is not rejected. So basically we are supporting H now. So now we have a confidence. We are not making mistakes. I mean, our conclusion is correct. So the confidence is also the probability of making the right decision when H now is true is one minus R. All right? Second category, so H now is actually wrong. So we are having something wrong, but our data tells us that nothing wrong here. So I'm making a different type of error called type 2 error or beta error rate. So beta error means that when the ground truth is actually abnormal, but you tell us it's normal, you have to have two error. In contrary of that is when H now is not true, we use our sample, we use our test to reject H now. It means that we have some detection power, which is one minus beta in this case. Does that make sense? So this type one, type two error is one of the most important concepts in this class. Alright? Make sure you understand that. So here I have a chart. Remember that all of our hypothesis testing so far we have learned is based on normal distribution. And this is the normal distribution is now. Okay? By design, we allocate our half hour rate into two sets equally. So we have half hour up here and half hour up here. So by design, we are tolerating some errors. Alright? It means that even the ground truth is normal, we cannot classify or decide that all of the samples tell us it's normal. We always have some error, which is called up error rate. But it should be very small. What is the most popular number we have given so far? For alpha? Yeah. So far, right? It means that when H now is true, our decision tells that it's true or it's not rejected. But this also is small probability which is one minus alpha. So which is sorry, it's alpha. It's five percent chance that we will tell you this is rejected. So this alpha rate should be small by design. Okay? In the second case, so the ground truth is actually we have a shape in mean, which is H1. This is the truth. <laughs> So actually, we have a different scenario than the first one. So now we have a shifted mean. We have a different distribution, which means that we have something wrong with the manufacturing process. But in this case, we may still classify the process as in normal condition. Right? So in this, for example, like this, which region tells us the process is normal? This one, this one, or this one? Okay, this is my now decision. Okay. So the two sides are rejection region, right? And here is acceptance region. If the real real distribution is like this, right? Which region will give us a wrong decision when this is true? This region, let's say this is region 1, region 2, and region 3. 
which region gives us a incorrect decision tree? Region three. Region three. When we have a sample that lies in region three, what is our conclusion? Reject. Three means reject. It's not right. Which is wrong or correct? Correct. 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 If this is correct, we are making a good decision. Are we having our power or type of slider? Power. Power, okay. So this is our detection power. How about region 2? It's on a different side, right? We use the accept and we make error. We have a straight error. How about region 1? Mm -hmm. Even the one is not very likely. We still may have it. All about one. We have the same thing with two or three. So one is in the rejection region of it's not, right? So when the sample is in region one, we are having the same decision with region three. Mm -hmm. But only this case is very unlikely because the two mean is here. The probability here is very small. Alright? Alright, so that's the four different scenarios we are making decisions for hypothesis testing. So now I want you to think about what does it what does it really mean uh, making R error, beta error, or detection power over competence? What does it mean in the physical example? So or in other words, what is the price of making a certain type of error? If you are making a type, type 1 error, what is the price that you pay? Let's say you are monitoring the manufacturing process, it's running continuously, and you found something wrong, and then what is the price? Defective pieces. What's that? Defective pieces. Defective pieces. But the first step is actually normal in type 1, right? For type 1, the reality is that the first step is normal. Mm -hmm. So then, but your conclusion is that you have a defective piece, you know, right? So then, what is the price? Let's speak up. Uh, I mean, like, uh, you, you will be losing some time. Yes. <laughs> because you, are, you need to stop the product line, make a manual inspection, you're losing some time. Well, it's also called product <coughs> down time, but it's because of nothing, it's because of your wrong decision. So you are losing money because of that, right? So how about type 2 error rate? You, if you are making a type 2 error, what do you lose? Reputation. Reputation. That's a jump in conclusion. If you are <laughs> making a type 2 error, means the product or process is really out of control. It's abnormal. But you say that it's normal. So you are allowing some defective parts to go to the market, right? So then, you may have an increased warranty cost, you may have a damaged reputation, the customer may post terrible things to Facebook, whatever, social media, right? So then your reputation is damaged. So, which one is more deadly, in your opinion? Which one do you want to vote? If you are can only minimize one, which one do you want to prioritize? Type 2. Type 2, because type 2 is more costly. But still, type 1 is not desirable, right? But you can only do one. We'll talk about it later. Alright, so now, how do we calculate this? So basically, we will translate the concept of type 1, type 2 to some formula. So here, the type 1 error rate is a conditional probability. The real condition is that H1, H0 is true in reality. But when you calculate, your organization probability that we have a rejection of each now. So it's a conditional probability given by this equation. And then we need to use our CAD statistic, Z0 or T0, whatever you based on your uh, based on your assumption on the statistic. And it falls in the rejection region given that it's now is true. Right? So after this, you get a have one error. So in this case, this is our rejection region by design, right? We will calculate the sum of these two correlations, which is the area of these two, which is alpha by design. So alpha is controllable. We can choose our alpha rate. 
I depending on the limit. All right. But the type two is a different scenario in the sense that the ground truth is now is false. All right. And our decision is that we cannot reject it now. It also means that the test statistic is not falling into the reject region. Okay, so in this case, if this is my true distribution, my beta error rate will be the left side of this. So actually, it won't precisely be between these two, but this poor rate is always almost zero, so we can ignore that. So this is my beta error rate. Alright, so now I have a question for you. If you are designing a hypothesis test, and you control both alpha and beta arrays in the design of the test. We already know that alpha array is controllable by right? choosing the length, right? So how about beta? Thomas, you want to guess? Can we control both alpha and beta at the phase of design? Um, well, when you make alpha smaller, you increase beta, right? That's true. But can we, let's say, I want a beta to be 10%. Uh, I don't care about alpha, but can I control beta at a phase of design after the test? I'll do that. All right, give you a hint. In order to capture this, what information do we need? H now is false, but we also need to know the true distribution of H1. Right. We need to know this in order to capture the beta. But if this is not known, we cannot have a beta band design phase. Right. Okay. So the part of the test is one minus beta with the complement back of the beta array, which is this read. The one minus beta. We want to increase one minus beta and also minimize our batteries in the design phase. And also the rejection limits are based on H now parameter and the user requested alpha. So this is predefined. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at one example. How can we have the numbers for our and beta? So I have my Two studies have the test given by this. I'm testing my population mean. I don't know whether the mean really is really zero or not. And I have a shift in mean. So mu one is mu zero plus delta. Delta is not zero. We have a shift. That's like what is showing the previous part right here. And how do we calculate that? We plug in our information from the test. Right it's now, it's not true. It's not. If one is you say that x really follow the distribution and mu one instead of mu zero and sigma square. We assume sigma square is not changed in this case. So this is my formula, all right? I'm calculating the, the uh, probability that x bar is not in the rejection region. In other words, x bar is within the limit, all right? And I have this. My condition is that x bar follows normal distribution with mean of mu one, not mu zero. But sigma is the same. I have my sample size n, so we can adjust the variance. Okay? So I plug in a number like this, I normalize x bar. So x bar minus mu 1 divided by sigma, whatever, that is in the numerator, the numerator, we have a standard normal distribution. So this follows standard normal distribution. So then we can use the CDF of standard normal distribution to calculate this. So this is a standard formula for calculating the beta algorithm when we have a mean shape. So there are several things we need to make sure. First, there's no change in sigma square. And second, here's h1, not h now. When you normalize this, you're normalizing based on mu1, not mu0. Okay, this is very confusing. Many people make mistakes here. x bar minus mu1, not mu0. Because x bar is our sample mean we calculate based on our samples. And samples follow the true distribution of H1 or H now. Okay? We have that, we have this, so we can calculate the beta rate. All right, if you look at this equation, 
liberation of stigma is the same. We have two parameters that may influence beta rays. One is delta, one is n. Okay? So now I'm going to ask you the influence of each of them. So basically beta is a function of delta and some set. Alright? Only the function is more complex than given by the formula over there. If I have a increase delta, do you expect beta to be smaller or larger? Smaller or larger? How many of you say it's uh, smaller? Okay, how many of you say it's larger? Okay, by intuition, right? User intuition. If you have a distribution that is very different to your true, assume it's not. To assume your detection power to increase or decrease? Increase. Okay. If I move my H1 all the way here, outside the monitor, okay, what is the power? What is the beta area in this case? It's very hard to make a mistake in this case, right? Beta is almost zero because they are so different. Alright? So then, will beta increase or decrease? Decrease, right? Sometimes it's more convincing to your intuition than that. Okay. Don't look at this and, oh, what do I do with this? So I increase, decrease, and then you'll be very confused, right? But this is mathematically proven at that, right? Okay, how about sample size? When sample size increases, does our beta increase or decrease? Increase. Increase? Decrease? Increase? Increase. Increase. So how many of you say it increases? Only you? Okay. How many of you say it decreases? Okay. So, so why is it increased or decreased? Can we intuitively guess on the result? When your sample size increases, then it means that your information is enriched, right? You have more information. Okay, that's that's called this manual. Very plan here. But n increases, this part will decrease it with the negative sign, right? When this decreases, and then we also know the CTF of the normal distribution is the increasing function. All right? Something like this, right? When this increases, this decreases, the whole thing decreases. And here, when this thing increases, this decreases, the whole thing decreases, and then with this decreases. This part is uh, decreased, this part is increased. Any guess? Well, wouldn't the same be about delta? If we were delta say. is the same. Okay, let's uh, formalize this, alright? So beta is given by. I will not give you the conclusion in class because I don't know. 
Think about it, and we discuss it in the very next lecture. Right. Yeah, we don't need a conclusion for this now. Okay, so, Brad, so what's your take? I had a question regarding just like the yeah. beta rejection zone uh -huh. or um, the power of beta. Uh, is it all, always one tail? And because I was trying to envision like a two tailed one, but that would just mean the same mean, different standard deviations. So that would just be chi squared. So, like, it's yeah, different. it's possible. And well, later when we talk about uh, X bar chart, R chart, and uh, S chart, then we have two sided scenario in that case. Okay. But about here, you don't have two sided here. But this side is so small. This tail is so small, right? Yeah. And we have this part is larger, but this part is nothing almost. But we do have two sided scenarios. Okay. Particularly for chi square distribution, you are uh, you may either overestimate or underestimate your sigma square. Both are possible. Okay. You have a comment? Okay. Yeah, I mean that we can go to the last last step. Okay. Uh, in in the slide, the probability. probability. Which slide? Uh, no, no, no. Just the last Yeah. Uh, the not the last step, but the, uh, the fourth one. Here? Uh, the next one. This one? Yeah. Uh, I mean, when it comes to the... Uh, uh, well, how about this? We <coughs> consider this as after class discussion, and we'll discuss this during the beginning of the lecture. Okay. Because alpha beta are also associated with control charts. Okay, so we don't need conclusion for now, right? Okay, so I have one example here. Um, let's say we have a simple state given by this. We are testing the mean of something. And uh, the uh, alternative hypothesis mu is not equal to 16. And here we have mu equal to 16. We have a random sample of 9 in hands. So the sample size is 9, right? And then our type 1 algorithm is design, designed as alpha of 105. They have two-sided standard normal distribution scenario. And we just have two average if the true mean contains are really 16.1. OK, so before we go through the mathematics, do we expect the beta average to be large or small? Let's first guess how many of you guess that the beta area will be above 50 percent. <coughs> so, this is my <coughs> assumption, and this is the reality. Okay, do you expect beta to be above 50 or below 50 percent? Just take a guess. Okay. <coughs> below, <coughs> above, so we have both voices. About 50%? 50%? 50%? Yeah, 5-0. 5-0. Below. Below? Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say, uh, let's, how many of you say it's below 50? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, around 7, 8, 10. How many of you say it's uh, above 50? Okay, so let's say majority wins for now. Okay, I say it's below. I see that it's up. Okay, so here the calculation is before. We just plug in the information into the formula we just got from the previous slide. And have the number which is 14.9%. Okay. So sometimes the change is in absolute value, like 0.1 or 1 or 2, it doesn't mean anything. You need to associate that with standard deviation. So delta divided by sigma, that really matters. Not a delta only. Okay. All right. Here are two facts that are very useful for type one type two analysis. First, for a given sample size, one risk can only be reduced at the expense of increasing the other risk. You cannot reduce both of them simultaneously. And second, for a given type one errors, a desired type two error can be achieved by increasing the sample size. Okay? At the price of an increase of inspection cost. So this is what we were discussing here. <coughs> if you increase your sample size, your beta error rate will be decreased. It's 
ยังช่วยชิวเลยขาดหายยังมอตาโกยังไปเลยโรยยังไงมอตเนมิงก็รู้ยังพร้อมอยู่เลยนะปัจจุบันก็จะเป็นพร้อมกันตัวตัวอาร์ตคลาสหายก็เป็นนอตตัวอาร์ตคลาส Alright, so now let's talk about next topic: methods and philosophy of SPC. Do you remember what SPC is? What does SPC stand for? Statistical process control. Okay, there are key words: statistics. So far, we have revealed many concepts about statistics. Now, how do we do that? That's the whole focus of this topic. Yes. I have a question on the previous slide. Uh -huh. So, if we increase the sample size, won't we increase like one error as well? Or type one? Yeah. So type one is designed by you. Okay. The, the scenario is like. <laughs> the two facts here, in both of statements, something is fixed, something is not fixed. Okay. Let's review the whole procedure. All right. So we have a um, we have a design. We first specify our hash, and this stage we predetermine the alpha. So alpha will not be changed. So then, if alpha is not changed, we only increase the sample size. Then beta will be decreased. But for the same. Each one, all right. So something change, something I change. That's how they can do it. That's a good point. So for SPC, statistical process control. What tools can we use? Um, for the control part, it's before the X part. What else? Um, probably the tools we just been talking about, like how about the testing and uh, <coughs> confidence interval, the p values. Some interval, e value, and uh, hypothesis testing. So these are basically one group, right? Mm -hmm. Statistical difference. The control part is a different one. What else? So actually, SPC is not as difficult as you imagine. <laughs> we have already used two tools, at least two tools in over one. In the first before, I asked you to visualize the data, right? Which one do you use? Instagram. Instagram, yes. <coughs> what else? Scatter plot. Scatter plot. That's very good. <coughs> so these two are pretty straightforward, but are very useful. They all normally serve as a starting point to analyze some data. And control charts will be the focus of the coming five or six lectures. We will cover that. And this is about inferences. This really supports our statistical background of control charts. Right? Still remember how do we define quality in modern manufacturing? So quality is inversely proportional to variability of variance, right? So this Yeah, this is just for illustration model. I think mathematicians will kill me for this. <laughs> but they are, you know, the dead idea, right? But in order to do quality control, our goal is very much. Quality control is to reduce variability, right? So, because variability is a very big term. To model that, we can use variance, right? And also, if mu change as of another shape, it also will increase variability. So basically, this is our focus. We want to make sure mu is always mu zero and the variance as small as possible. In six sigma process, we have six sigma. <coughs> okay, and that's for process capability analysis. So. A brief, a brief review here. SPC is about controlling variation in production. And there are two types of variations. First one is chance process or column process. So this type of course 
is not avoidable. It's always there. We cannot do anything with it unless we invent some new machine. That's what in our three types of process improvement. <coughs> First lecture, we have three types. One is something like this, and one something like this, right? Mm -hmm. something like this. We have a new machine, we have a breakthrough that can significantly reduce the variability. But really, in everyday manufacturing, are doing this. And this is also referred to as continuous improvement. A very important philosophy in manufacturing potential. So this type of variation is not a controllable mostly, so we can do something like breakthrough innovation. Let's say we have this distribution, we are producing many, many parts every day, and we are collecting all samples. It turns out that there are distributions like this, 5, 5.5, 4.2. It appears to be normal, right? It's within your range. But uh, one day, okay, the good life is end. You have a 7.2. So now you start wondering what happened. Is my process really out of control, or this is basically mm. a chance for us? Do we know that? We don't know unless we do a thorough test of the machine, of the production, everything. And then you have a 7.7. That is even worse. Then what do you, you may increase your you may decrease your confidence in your process really in control, right? And then it's even worse than this too. So now, really, you, if you are at this stage, you really to stop your machine and do a test. And it turns out that your true process is like this. There's a mean shift. So this is called a sample course, a special course. So this normally represents a much larger variation than a chance course. And also, this rise is somewhat unpredictable. And there are some many reasons for this. For example, the operator errors, material defects, machine failures, two deflation, everything. There are many, many real process for this. This is general large, but it can be corrected. So after you have this, you do a correction. You can reduce your variation by bring your distribution back to normal. So that's very important. It's also called a out of control action. Let's say, look at it in the time scale. So this is my quality control characteristic. And we have a distribution like this. We have one from process mean to zero. And we have two limits here. What is SL here? What's that? Spike limit. Spike limit. Spike limit limits. They are really telling you whether your product is conforming or not conforming. All right? Mm -hmm. Alright, so everything is good in the beginning. Mu zero, sigma zero, they are both normal. And then, at some point, we have this problem. The mu is shifting. The sigma is zero. It's still sigma zero. But in this case, we have one type of sample point. <coughs> they may have, it may be due to a change in setup. Like you incorrectly input your pressure from 10 psi to 20 psi. So this will be the, that type of change. And next step, your mu is still normal, but you have a wider distribution. You have a larger standard deviation. In this case, it's normally due to one tooth. And now you have, so in this case, what will change in your product quality? Why is a wider distribution not there? And it will give you more products out of that spec that your defective rate will be increased. Okay. So this is not desirable as well. And finally, we have both. This is a worst scenario. But the good news is that all of these assembled courses can be detected, monitored, and removed. Once you remove this shift, your process will back to normal. Okay, so that is very straight, very straightforward. But the natural variation is not avoidable. That's very hard. Okay. So I talk about this concept. 
many times in control, out of control, effective, non effective. But what do they mean? What are the differences between these two groups of concepts? So, in control, a in control process is a process operating with only chance process present. Okay? And in control is equivalent to the presence of chance process, and these two are also equivalent to distribution and chains. Both mean and variance are constant. On the other hand, out of control process is a process operating in the presence of a sample process. So that's the major difference. In addition to natural variation, it also has a sample process causing larger variations. So for the out of control process, it is equivalent to the fact that the distribution is changed. Either mean or variance or both are changed. Does that make sense? Okay, so now I have a question for you. For an in control process, do I always produce conforming products? No. Why? Because the fact limits are still limits. They are always something outside the limits. So anything outside the limits are considered non conforming. Okay? So the conforming or non conforming is not defined by the customer expectation. Right. Same thing, for an out of control process, it may still produce conforming product. Only the defective rate is much higher than in control process. Okay, that's one major difference you need to remember. So, how can HTC help us with the reduction of variation? There are three major objectives of HTC. First one, monitoring the process and detecting any process change for all of control scenarios. So for this one, I use control charts. Okay. The second is to do diagnosis. Not only you need to know what is wrong, you also need to know why it is wrong. What is wrong? That's the root cause diagnosis. Yeah, root of course, you analyze your process change patterns and you may be you may do a cost effect analysis and then you bring your product back to normal. And third, providing correct detection plans. So first, and the most basic action is to remove a sample process. Also, you can do STD plus automatic process control or HTC, like a real-time control or running time control thing. So if this is introduced, your process is more automated. Your efficiency will be much improved. And third, is really about a design experiment, robust design. So in this chart, you can see this is the loop. Again, it's a continuous improvement. You monitor the process continuously by making environment, and then you detect whether anything is wrong with the HTC monitor. If something is wrong, you find the root cause, formula actions, take action, and go back to the process, so on and so forth. There are seven very important tools. They are also called a magnificent seven tools. Histogram, we know what that is. And scatter diagram, we have used that already in Comer 1. And for the remaining check sheets, Pareto chart, cause and effect diagram, effect transition diagram, and control charts. We are going to go through them one by one very briefly. What is a check sheet? Anyone of you is doing the senior design this semester? Anyone? Okay. You need to check your progress with the TA every week, right? So that's kind of another version of the check sheet. Whether you are doing your job, whether you are missing some meeting, something like that. But in manufacturing, it's more complicated. So this is one example for a uh, check sheet. So here are defects, one, two, three, one, two, three. And one to five total, what does this mean? The rules are most important to see. Parts, damage, machining problems, other other problems. So each row represents one type of rule of course. Okay? And these are basically the frequency distribution. So twelve, maybe twelve months or twelve hours, something like that in time. And then you have a total number, 
I have total number here, which is the total number of programs for all program types over the entire time scale. Okay. So this is a very simple tool for data collection, but it is very useful for giving a time-oriented summary for historical data. And also, you can look for trends or other meaningful patterns. For example, if you look at this, 4, 5, 14, 12, 5, you can see clearly there are two models here. There's one peak here, another peak here. You may expect that there are two Google courses occurring at these two time points. So that's one example of inferring based on it. But this is not a, so helpful because you have this information which is very detailed, but it's hard to see which problem is the most severe problem. Then we have this different tool, yes. What was the, uh, the one through five on the right hand side? Here? Yes. And you get? Um, maybe like a severity? So this can be anything, okay. So this, this can be like time, this can be like a um, machine or station ID or factory session ID. So it depends on how you define this thing, right? So basically they give you a distribution of the programs in terms of time, legal and location or category, okay? You should be designing this as a quality engineer. Okay. Okay, Proto chart. So Proto is an uh, economist, and he observed that in 1906, mm -hmm. in Italy, 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the population. It's also known as Proto principle, also known as 1820 rule or law of mobile view. So in other words, in manufacturing, we replace this as <coughs> the programs are caused by 70% of the forces. If you look at this example, still the same example, alright? We have this, we rank all the programs by frequency. So this guy has the most programs in correct dimension, 36, and we rank them from top to bottom. For these four programs, we will have one occurrence for each of them. So you can observe that the majority of the programs are really this five or four. So this is very useful in identifying the most severe programs in your manufacturing process. Okay, this one is interesting. Cause and effect diagram is also called fishbone diagram. So a fishbone diagram, you have a defect here, and you have all of the different branches. Each branch represents one major category. So here you have a machine, you have a material, you have methods, you have measurement and personnel. So really you are classifying all of these small programs into several big categories. <coughs> How do we do that? First, we define the program as defect to be analyzed. In this case, it's defect on hex. There are various reasons and cause defects. So then we form a team, like from production, from design, from quality control group, we have people to form a team, and we do a brainstorming, and we try to identify all the possible reasons for this. So then we have a effect box and a center line, like this one. And next, we categorize our program into each category. So here we form categories. And if possible, or if next we're going to form some new categories. Because sometimes you may miss something in the beginning, but you'll find something out there. You may need to iterate on this process. And finally, you run all other resources to identify the courses that are seen most likely to impact the program. So in this phase, you may want to eliminate some less important courses. Right? Okay. Cause and effect diagram. We did a case study in the first lecture about uh, frumpy cooking, right? If you are cooking your turkey, and the tens of that is a turkey, the turkey tastes terrible, so then you may want to identify your problems. Can we draw a picture diagram for that? Okay, the categories. 
the property is good, categories, machines. What would be wrong with the machine? Your oven will be malfunctioning. Okay. What else? With the machine? Think about what a cooking utensil into your cooking and property. You need thermometer to be malfunctioning. The monitor? Meat. Meat. Ah, uh, it's supposed to be here. Ah, oh, okay. The like temperature control or something like that, right? That can be my function if you do a wrong feedback. You may burn your turkey excessively and they have a burn turkey. Right? How about the materials? Mm -hmm. The turkey could be not tested by itself. It could be a, you know, uh, a turkey that uh, on the shelf for a very long time, or they have some problem with that. Okay. What else with materials? In that example, we talk about many different ingredients, right? Any of them would be wrong, right? So how about the methods? <coughs> there are, for example, one work sequence that can be corresponding to the recipe sequence. So you do the brushing first, cooking first, which tag, put the which ingredients. Anything can get wrong here as well. Okay? So this actually this is a major course in my opinion. So how about the measurement? So here, incorrect specific limit. Maybe you are having a too high expectation of your cooking skill. Okay? Maybe that's in control process only it's not this big. It's possible. And also it could be a voltage gauge. So by seeing that, probably you just had a very spicy food, and then it says it's turkey, it says everything, everything tastes like spice, right? That's another reason. And of course now, maybe a poor attitude, okay, not cooking unhappy, right? Or in suffering the training, I'm sure that's the major reason for me if I'm cooking that turkey. And also maybe inadequate supervision, if your parents are not more trying you closely, maybe some create a mistake. So you can see that the physical diagram is very useful in identifying the rule of process, no matter in manufacturing or in cooking in any different application. Alright, so next is get a diagram. So back then, um, I did not specify the correlation coefficient. It's really called a Pearson's correlation coefficient. It's defined as this. So it quantifies a correlation between two variables. So in this case, you can we can infer that these two parameters are very closely correlated. If you do a line, probably have a linear regression like this. But one important thing to remember is that correlation does not imply causal relationship. It just means that these two variables are correlated. It doesn't mean this affects this or this affects this. It doesn't not mean that, right? So is it, if it doesn't imply that, does it imply that both are affected by a common source? That could be. It could be. But then there has to be, or I guess, yeah, like, wouldn't there be something above that? There has then, to be here now. Is it, is, is it still like coincidence? Well, that uh, you can do a thorough investigation on more than one parameter. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, for example, in sociology, like um, one the example would be, does that equation affect your income? Okay. Intuitively, they would say yes, right? But they're debating how to prove this mathematically. If you have this correlation like this, I have to say that they are they have to be correlated. Maybe some underlying factors like the IQ of one person. You don't know that, right? The higher IQ one has, the higher the patient is, which you will likely get. So then the higher income. So you don't really know what is the underlying factor. So there would there must yeah, be would be. I don't know if there's much. It could be a coincidence. Okay, right. yeah. it's more complex. But it's, it's a good point. All right, that's about uh, scatter diagram. The next one is the fact contribution diagram. It can be used to identify particular locations and link with potential forces. So, for example, here is a refrigerator. And the surface finished in fact. You have um, six surfaces. You mark the effect on each of them. And then it can help you identify your problems. For example, you have the defects at these several dots. 
what is the potential performance for this one? Actually, we will move the replicator in that some friction underneath the factory. Right? Another example is for engine machining. So this is a true production um, data from some automobile company. And uh, if you measure the surface, you can see the surface has some variations, right? So traditionally, people only monitor the entire surface by calculating flatness, maximum, minus, minimum. But it's only one number. Using one number, you may know it's good or bad, but you don't know which location goes wrong. So instead, we can have a high-dimensional monitoring chart. So we monitor each location on the surface. And then we circle out the bad areas like this. And then we know that, for example, here, I have a cluster of defective locations. I know that something goes wrong with this. Maybe the chatter problem with the cutter or the cutter is something is suddenly breaking at this point. So then it can help me identify the root cause for this problem. So this is very important because if you do not have this, you only have one single number thing, you have a defect, defective part. Then why is that? Remember, we have auto control action plan. We need to identify the root cause and remove that so that we can improve our process. So this is very important. Another two examples, outside manufacturing. The first one, I used this example earlier. When you rent a car, you have this checklist. You mark the scratches on the surface. Right? So that's one thing. And when you return a car by comparing the incoming car and, and the outcoming car, you can know what square is of course by yourself. So then depending on the severe, uh, severe level that the runner company will decide to charge it or not charge it. That's one another example. The final example for uh, defective condition diagram is in shirt manufacturing. So here I will think for checklist, check sheet. So check sheet can be just uh, in numbers. They can also have a chart, mm -hmm. a figure. So when they have a figure, this figure is called a defect, defect condition diagram. So here, this shirt, after the um, manufacturing, there's one um, quality control. If you buy a shirt, there's always just one round, you know, sticky paper. It's a QC number. That means that a person in a QC group, the, that's the ID of the person. Okay. So then he or she made inspection, but uh, underlying that is your that this. So in this case, we have three types of uh, floors. Uh, floor, tier, and mark. Oh, this is really a horrible shirt. I'm sure this shirt will not go into the market. But if you get the point, they mark the problems. By looking at this, you, can, you have more marks here and here. They probably due to the, you know, the sewing process of the bodies. So by doing this, you can more convincingly identify the ruler first. Okay, control charts. So now finally we are reaching the point of control charts. So the control charts have three objectives. First, monitoring, the process of detecting process changes. And second, estimating the process of mean and the values. And third, guiding the decision or adjusting the process of mean and the values. So recall that this is our chart. SPC monitoring is always the first step in this whole action stage. First, you need to make sure that you really are having some problems. If you have problems, you find the root cause and you do some action. If not, you just go back to the next cycle. Right? Okay, control charts, the concept is very straightforward. I already have this figure many times in my previous lectures. If a person is in control, my mu is mu zero, which is the nominal value, and I have some variation, and I have most of my product, products falling into this range, which is good. Okay? The process is in control, and statistically speaking. And then I have these two limits, which are called lower and upper control limits, no longer back limits, control limits here. And then I monitor my process. If this happens, I have some mean shape. So most of my samples will fall outside 
the upper limit. So I claim that I have all the control process. So that's this. Does this look familiar to you guys? Where did we use this before? So this two slide is also called what the region? Rejection region in which topic? So it's very similar in this sense that you are testing each sample, whether it holds in your rejection region or not. So more formally, a control chart is a graphical display of a quality characteristic that has been measured or computed from sample versus sample number of times. Okay. And uh, it has several components. The center line. The center line represents the average value of the quality characteristic corresponding to the in control state. Okay. So this may or may not be zero, depending on your population mean. And you have upper and lower control limits. They are chosen so that the process is in control almost all of the sample points will fall between them. Okay. If a process is in control, some samples are outside the control limit. We will have a what type of error? R error. Okay, because the process is in control, but we incorrectly determine that the process is out of control. So have an upper array. And again, upper array can be controlled by choosing upper and lower control limit. So if you have these samples, we draw the samples in the control chart by the order of sequence. This is different the hypothesis testing. We assume that those samples are drawn in sequence in time order in a control chart. Okay? So later we will see the difference between this and hypothesis testing. So what happens if you have all the control scenarios, so then you need to have a all the control action plan. So all the control action plan is a flow chart or text-based description of the sequence of activities that must take place following all the control signal. So this is one example. You have all the control in the X bar R chart. You have something to check around the procedure, or for each of them you have two outcomes, yes or no. If yes, you go here, if no, you go here. Depending on the production or the manufacturing process, you may have very different out of control action plans. But this is real application dependent. And also by doing that, doing this circle here, you can improve your process continuously. Okay. The construction of control chart is very straightforward. Actually, you can do this after seeing this single slide. Still remember Schuhart? Schuhart is a very famous person who is the father of modern manufacturing control or service control or attitude quality control. He's, a, he's a, the person who designed the first control chart. The control chart is given by this formula. We have three numbers, upper control limit, central line, and lower control limit. If we have one monotone statistic, as denoted by W here, and we assume that W follows normal distribution, and W1, W2, WI, WN, they are independently distributed, and then our control limit are tested like this. And here we have one parameter to be determined for this case. By the way, here we assume our mu of W and sigma of W, they are both known. They can be estimated from historical data or they are given by the uh, manufacturing uh, supplier, right? And have that, the only controllable parameter is k. So k is the distance of control limit or between the upper limit and center line or lower limit and center line. So it is the metric for normal distribution monitoring of mu. Okay. If k is equal to 3, which is the normal choice, it's very commonly chosen as 3 in manufacturing. In this case, we will have a upper rate of 0 0.0027. 
which is roughly 0.27 percent. It means that if you use this control chart and your process is in control, you will have roughly 0.27 of your products will be incorrectly claimed as out of control. Okay? You can also choose K as 2. In manufacturing, people normally use K of 2 as warning them. If you have your samples outside two sigma limit, and maybe a warning signal for you, you may want to pay more attention to your manufacturing process. It will increase the sensitivity of the control chart, but it will also increase the sensitivity of your control chart and thus higher post alarms. So this is one example. I have our uh, piston ring on the monitor. Uh, the major quality characteristic is the inner diameter, which is very important because in assembling the piston ring, the diameter of the piston ring will affect the performance of the piston and more the engine, the efficiency of the engine is very important. So we collect the data like this. So each row is one sample, and we have 25 samples. Each sample can have a bar. And we know from historical data that the mu zero is 75 millimeter, and the variance is nine. It means the standard deviation is three. So the first problem, what is the sample distribution of sample average? So what is the distribution of X bar? X follows normal distribution, so X bar also follows normal distribution. Does X bar and X have the same mu and sigma? Yes or no? No. Okay. X bar follows normal distribution. So X bar will follow normal distribution with a shrink standard deviation. Sigma 0 divided by the end. Okay? Part B. Construct a monitoring chart on the sample average. It's also called X bar control chart. The sample size of N equals 5 and K is 3. We just plug in the information in our formula and then have a control limit, like this. So it's mu X bar plus and minus K sigma X bar. So K in this case is 3. And sigma X bar is the from here. And our control limit like this 79 and 71, roughly. And we can see that this control chart is. Symmetric around mu zero. 